Welcome to Agnes Duty's auditorium. Agnes, um, one of the people who gave me some training in public speaking, so we're in, we've got good energy in this space. Welcome to our um, sadly final Plugged Into Energy Research Lecture of 2022. It is, a, it is a sad day, but the good news is we will um, pick this ball right back up in the spring uh, and we'll be offering some lectures around energy efficiency specifically. So I wanna thank everyone in the room for coming. Many of you I recognize now because you are um, diehard supporters of our peer lectures um, and they're an important tool for us we are really committed at the university, but also particularly through Cooperative Extension, which is um, where I work, um, to make sure that the public has access to the latest and greatest science-based information around many topics. Um, tonight, obviously, we're talking about energy. That's a big topic. Um, we're gonna talk about grid reliability in particular. Um, I'm really impressed of the folks on the live stream who I'll wave to in the um, in the cloud there thanks for joining us from home my name is kate venturini hardesty um, i've been here at uri for a long time as a student graduate student and now um, as a cooperative extension staff member really pleased to bring you this program that we are calling ensuring electric grid reliability preparing for increased demand from the highway to home heating which by the time we're done tonight that very long title that we tried to shorten unsuccessfully will make a lot more sense to you. So um, really quick, I always take an opportunity when I can be in front of people to talk about cooperative extension and how amazing it is. Those of you who have heard me say this multiple times, um, just bear with me, but we are um, the arm of the university here that um, interacts with the public. Majority of what we do is outward facing. Um, we love students, we love faculty members, we love our, our colleagues, but um, we are charged with, with bringing resources out to communities and individuals, and we are particularly um, and keenly aware of the importance of doing that, um, making sure information is available to folks who are members of underserved communities and populations, and so our ability to live stream events like this is quite, quite an amazing, um, effect of the COVID pandemic. We had never done that before COVID happened, and now we realize we can bring you all together in person and also have you here at home. So um, tonight's program falls within our, obviously, energy efficiency, renewables, and conservation strategic area focus, but we do work in a lot of other strategic areas that are quite broad, and I would encourage you, if you, um, care about land, water, health, or food, uh, to check out other programs and resources we have. Um, everything is mostly free. So couple, just a couple housekeeping items. We, uh, one of the things we always do every time we host an extension program is try to measure the effectiveness on the audience we're delivering it to. So you're gonna get a survey in your email, probably tomorrow, it's only three questions. It'll take you three minutes tops. Um, and we just wanna know if you learned anything new, what you might do differently as a result of, of what you've learned tonight. And we use that information to make our programs better, but also to, to really measure their effectiveness. So thank you in advance for doing the homework we send you. We really appreciate that. And lastly, as I mentioned, there are um, folks at home live streaming this and it's also being recorded. So if there's anything you don't, you don't catch that was said, you can um, access this program from the comfort of your couch in about two days or so. So um, I would like to introduce my colleague, um, my comrade in, in organizing and planning all of these lectures this year, in addition to Kaylin, who many of you know, Kurta Bayan, come up, Kurta. Um, Kurta is our 2022 Feinstein Energy Literacy Energy Fellow, and he has been working with us all year 
to plan all three of the lectures that we've offered. If any of you weren't present for the first two, they are on YouTube and they were fabulous. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Kurta and say a few things. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <coughs> um, as Kay said, my name is Kurta Bean, and I'm honored to work with she and Kaylin to organize this event. Um, tonight, I will be introducing um, our moderator. But before doing that, I would love to extend thanks and appreciation to the sponsor, the 2022 sponsor of the Energy Fellows Program. And if anyone in the audience here wishes to sponsor the program, uh, please reach out to Kate or Kaylin. So our moderator of for the night is Greg Uhadema. He currently works for the Northeast Clean Energy Council's policy team on a wide range of state, national, and federal issues. Before joining NECEC, Greg works at Greg worked as an administrative assistant with Rice Engineering, and before that, as a program associate for Green Energy Consumers Alliance. While Green Energy Consumers Alliance, Greg educated the public on the organization and its advocacy goals, and also coordinated groundbreaking Green Community Electricity Choice Program in Rhode Island, set to increase renewable energy. Renewable energy. Um, Renewable energy adoption <laughs> in municipalities in, within Rhode Island. Greg has also interned for Senator Sheldon Warehouse uh, in the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resource. Greg is an alumni of the Tita Chi fraternity, and he holds a bachelor's degree in environmental and natural resource economics from the University of Rhode Island, and he co-authored the Rhode Island Guide to Growing Solar. Um, we are excited to have Greg moderate this event, and without further ado, I will not Turn over to Greg. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, uh, those live streaming. Thank you for coming out. Uh, like Kurt has said, my name is Greg O'Hadam. I'm the policy associate uh, at NECEC or Northeast Clean Energy Council. Um, I tend to think these usually go better when the moderators are pretty brief. Um, and uh, it's also giving me a little PTSD being back in this room. Uh, so uh, what I'll do right now is uh, I'll introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, Carrie Schlichting. Um, Carrie's a senior external affairs representative at ISO New England, uh, the region's independent non for profit grid operator. Uh, she's responsible for performing outreach to government officials in Connecticut and Rhode Island and previously Maine. Her work includes uh, tracking energy legislation and uh, administer administrative activity at the state public utility commissions and energy offices. Additionally, uh, Kerry supports regional collaboration between ISO New England and the New England states related to the clean energy transition. She also manages ISO New England's outreach to government officials uh, during power system events and emergencies. And Carrie uh, received her master's degree from Duke University's uh, Nicholas School of Environment and her bachelor's degree from Colgate University where she graduated cum laude. Uh, Carrie is also a member of the Connecticut Power Society's New, New Energy Professionals Committee. Hello, Carrie. So glad to be here. Thanks to Greg and Kate and everyone for getting tonight organized. I am going to speak on behalf of ISO New England and give a little bit of background about who we are and what we do um, and what we don't do in the region, and then talk a little bit about the work that my company organization is doing specifically with a focus on transportation electrification. So, is anyone here familiar with the ISO? Oh, wow, great, that never happens. Um, so, we're the independent system operator in New England, and we have been, as an entity around for over 20 years, we are regulated by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory um, Commission in Washington, D.C., they're our regulator. We are a reliability coordinator for New England as well, and 
we'll talk a little bit about what that means from a reliability perspective. And we always want to emphasize that in our role, we are independent of companies in the marketplace, and we are neutral on technologies that enter into our markets. What we're looking at is just electrons. So there are three main roles that the ISO plays in New England. Um, grid operation is the day-to-day -day balance of energy supply and demand. We have a grid operators that are working to maintain that power in 12-hour shifts every day of every year, um, all year long. We also run a market, uh, and we administer a market in the region for different energy services. You can think of that as the stock exchange. We don't own any of the commodities, we don't buy any commodities that are passing through, but we are the marketplace and the platform that allows the buying of selling of energy in New England. And then finally, we do power system planning. And what that means is we are responsible for looking into the future and making sure that the power is reliable for what the demand may be. And that has a lot of different um, aspects when we think about the electrification of transportation and the heating systems and what those new types of load will do to the type of demand that we see in the region. So I'm going to talk mostly about that part of our work today, but happy to answer questions about the others as well. So just briefly, things we don't do. We are not um, in any way responsible for the electricity that I get at my home or you get at your home or the bill you get from your utility. Um, those are owned by the local utilities and regulated through the states. We don't own or maintain any of the transmission or power generating resources in New England. And as I mentioned, we are independent. We don't have any stakes in com of companies that are participating in the New England power markets. So when we think about reliability, reliability means something different to me from my place at the ISO than it does to possibly other people in this room. And when we think about that, there is reliability that, we're, that we are part of the North American interconnected grid. So NERC, you see it's the yellow map up there, that's Canada and the US, and all of these we are all part of a certain level of technical standards for engineering for operating the power grid. FERC and then the NPCC, which is the Northeast Power Coordinating Council, also have different levels of reliability and different standards that we have to meet from engin engineering and operating perspective. And those are really ensure, are in place to ensure that the power stays on and that we are communicating across state lines and across the ISO's borders with our neighboring power systems so that in the event of emergency, no one is caught off guard, but that we are working together to keep the lights on. So when we think about reliability in the ISO, a lot of that has to do with the peak system demand. That is how much power is being used on the hottest, most humid days of the summer or in the coldest days of the winter. ISO, in ISO New England, the New England states, we are a we, what we call a summer peaking system. And that's because almost 100% due to air conditioning. When it's hot and humid, everyone cranks up their AC and that is a really big draw on the electric, uh, creates a lot of demand on the electric system. Um, but at the same time, improvements in energy efficiency and buildings have really brought down the overall peaks and we no longer see the same level of peaking numbers of demand of 28,000 megawatts that we used to see 10 years ago, but that doesn't mean there's still not challenges associated with meeting those, those peaks on hot days. And when we look ahead, we talked about one of our roles is system planning, so that forward-looking aspect of the ISO. We're not only looking ahead to this winter or next year and next summer, we're doing long-term planning. So it's a 10-year forecast out. We're looking at what does the power system how does it change? What does it look like? And we see that the electrification of transportation and heating sectors are going to most likely shift that summer peak to the winter peak as we think about the electrification of home heating and vehicles. So this is Troy. He's one of our grid operators. But 
just really need to, I want to bring it to everyone's attention that what we're doing is keeping the power on. It's really, a, the operators are working hard in the control room. It's kind of like a NASA headquarters. This is like the real bread and butter of what we're doing. And we're planning ahead so that these guys and gals that are in this control room on a day-to-day -day basis have the resources and tools that are generating resources, transmission resources to meet the demand that they see coming down the way. So as I mentioned, we see electricity use is going, we forecast that it's going to increase in the next 10 years. And that's a big change from what we've been seeing. The last 10 to 15 years, energy efficiency and behind the meter solar PV have made our growth in the region almost flat and stagnant, if not declining at times. So for the fact that we see it increasing is a pretty big change and we see it increasing in the next 10 years, a small amount, but when you look out to 2035, 2040, it's a significant increase of the demand that will be on the, in the uh, demand on the grid. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about is to dig into the numbers of the electrification of the transportation sector today. So in 2020, ISO did our first transportation electrification forecasts. We were the first ISO in the country to develop these types of forecasts. And at the time, the, um, the impact was was minor. But as we, even in the two years that we've done it, we run it annually every year to be, to come out in May, we saw growth. And then this year for the first year, the forecast that were released in May, we included different, including a fleets, heavy duty, light, uh, instead of just light duty vehicles, we did medium duty delivery trucks, school buses, and transit buses. And this is being driven by state policies. States like Rhode Island um, and Massachusetts are, have goals to reduce the amount of carbon emitting transportation stock in their states as part of meeting their greenhouse gas reduction goals and their climate goals. So we thought at the ISO it was really important to start including that type of information in our forecasts to better understand how that would change overall demand. And when we look at the annual net electricity use, we anticipate that in 2031 it will increase 14% than what we saw last year. That's a not an insignificant amount, <laughs> negative, from the operator's perspective. It w especially when we think about what that means on the peak, on the days when the system is already running at its real max capacity. So here is a chart that looks about the transportation by the numbers, and you can see from 2022 to 2031, that at the peak, so this is for July and, and a summer day, that we anticipate that electric vehicles under current state policies and incentives at the federal and state level will increase demand at the peak hour over a thousand megawatts. That's a, that's a big amount when you think about how big our a power plant is or how much energy we use on those days. So, what we want need to, so when we think about this from an ISO perspective, we see this as an increase in demand, where at the same time, at the peak, we know that those are the times when there's going to be more solar on the system, and they're normally the hottest, sunniest days. So there's a real challenge of forecasting multiple types of new technologies coming on at different times in the day with different profiles that the ISO is trying to understand so that we can be prepared to support the region in its energy demands while acknowledging the policy drivers that are really changing these, making these changes. And to think about this in a New England versus a Rhode Island perspective, it may not seem like necessarily 1,000 megawatts is that much, but when you, think, when you look at the numbers, in New England, that's 1.5 million electric vehicles that are moving around, consuming power at different times with different charging patterns. And in Rhode Island alone, you can see some of the numbers that we forecast that there'll be uh, 100,000 personal light duty EVs over 300 school and transit buses that are electric, and over 150 medium duty ele delivery electric trucks. And that in total, in 2031, EVs in Rhode Island for, for all those classes will use 70 times more energy than in 2031 than they do now. And that's a, that's a big question of how do we model this from the perspective. And this involves a lot of vehicle miles traveled, uh, vehicle characteristics, weather patterns, 
seasonality of a school bus versus a public transportation fleet, or how do people travel? We see, are people traveling more at Christmas or Thanksgiving or the 4th of July? There's all these questions that are part of the assumptions that go into this type of modeling that you may not think of as a necessarily an energy issue from the wholesale market, but there are these small parts that are gonna add up to a significant demand for the region to handle. And then looking, at, looking to the future, this could all change. This is the picture, the snapshot of right now. And even in the last year, we've seen Biden administration has put out goals for the electrification of vehicles. We saw in Congress the Infl in Inflation Reduction Act has incentives for EVs, that bipartisan infrastructure law has funding for school buses and transit. And then the states are taking their own action. The, uh, there's a memorandum understanding across 15 states in the country about making their own goals to, to achieve this sort of de deployment of EVs, and as well as each individual state, like Rhode Island. So this is a big part of what my job is at the ISO, is tracking what the states are doing. So I cover Rhode Island, so I'm looking at all the programs that the OER is working at, anything that the Public Utility Commission is doing around rates and rate usage and how could that possibly affect the demand profile changes that we see due to electrification. And so this is just one small part of it, right? There's a whole other side is the heating um, electrification. So we're looking, we have a similar forecast for air source heat pumps and that has all sorts of similar challenges too based on geographic um, location in the New England states. A heat pump has a very different characteristic in Maine than it does in Rhode Island and the types of technology and the types of incentives. So my goal today was to give you a little bit of a, a sneak peek dive about what the transportation sector looks like and then talk a little bit more with my other panelists about what does this mean for reliability as we look forward. So. Those are my slides. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. That was great. Very informative. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our second panelist, uh, Jennifer Marpezi. Uh, Jennifer joined NEEP in July as a senior director of programs and strategy. In this role, Jennifer will implement and oversee uh, the organization's strategic programs. Uh, she will serve as NEEP's leader for program and project planning and management, uh, product solution, product slash solution development, as well as uh, support stakeholder engagement and fundraiser. Uh, before joining NEEP, Jennifer served as the chief, chief of people, culture and communication at uh, Peterson's Engineering where she positioned the firm for rapid growth while maintaining and enhancing organization, organizational culture and diversity. Prior to that, Jennifer served as the director of search services for United Personnel, where she recruited and placed nonprofit executives and advised clients on their diversity and inclusion practices. For nearly 10 years, Jennifer served as the executive director of the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, uh, NISA, where, she, where her efforts helped increase membership by 300% and staff retention by 50%. While growing sponsorships and diversifying revenue sources, Jennifer graduated uh, from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, with a bachelor's degree in journalism, earned a master's degree in organizational development and management from Fielding University, and also holds a Juris Doctor from the University of California. Let's give a round of applause. Thanks, Greg. Suddenly I feel really old. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, uh, and to be a part of the 2022 Plugged Into Energy Research uh, Lecture Series. So um, hang on here. There we go. Um, so today, um, uh, over the past few months, we've been bombarded with news stories warning us of the potential for rolling blackouts uh, across New England as temperatures plummet below freezing this winter uh, for days on end, the result of a power grid that can't keep up. 
Um, and concerns are dire enough that um, the five commissioners of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, Carrie uh, referred to earlier, um, actually made a visit to New England last month that was a pretty unprecedented visit um, to come to grips with just how serious the problem is. Um, so in the context of this already strained grid, how in the world are we gonna move toward electrifying everything? Today I'm gonna to touch on some of the issues related to electrification of our grid that most affect ratepayers. Um, I'll dive into a few questions including how can we equitably navigate this transition and ensure that nobody is left behind in our new clean energy economy? What is the role of the individual in um, ensuring grid reliability? And what policies and programs should we expect state and local governments to adopt to ensure reliable power? So, first let me uh, provide a little bit of background on NEEP, the organization that I work for. Uh, NEEP is a 26-year-old nonpartisan nonprofit uh, that works to accelerate building energy efficiency, electrification, and grid flexibility as a core strategy to reduce climate pollution and build an affordable, equitable, and resilient ec um, energy future. NEEP supports collaboration between government, industry, program administrators, utilities, academia, and advocates to drive long-term regional change. NEEP is one of six regional energy efficiency organizations across the country, and we work across 12 northeastern states and mid-Atlantic states, as well as the District of Columbia. NEEP has embraced a three-pronged strategy toward decarbonization. One of these strategies is market transformation through heating electrification. Space and water heating is extremely energy intensive, and in New England it's also extremely carbon intensive uh, because most of our heating systems still use oil and propane. Since 2014, NEEP has been a leader in market transformation uh, for high-performing cold climate heat pumps, and we work across the region to advance space and water heating solutions um, using electrification for homes and buildings. Another of our strategies is grid integration. As our building and transportation sectors are electrified, we need our buildings to be not just energy consumers, but flexible resources that can modulate consumption and even give energy back to the grid when needed. NEEP works on new technologies, regulatory, program, and business models that are needed for grid flexibility. But through this evolution, energy efficiency has continued to be the first of NEEP's strategy and priorities because it is the key to how we can continue to manage bills and meet greenhouse gas reduction goals while making the clean energy transition more affordable and equitable. Quite simply, the cheapest watt is a megawatt, or a watt, a unit of energy that is never consumed as a result of conservation or energy efficiency. So uh, speaking of feeling old, um, this slide of uh, former President Jimmy Carter wearing a heavy sweater during the 1970s energy crisis um, evokes a memory for those of us who've been around for a while. Uh, that conservation is an act of sacrifice for the greater good. Uh, we, we've always, we, historically, we've talked about energy efficiency as being the broccoli on your plate. It's, it's a tried and true approach. It doesn't necessarily engender a lot of excitement, uh, but it's been integral to NEEP strategy for the last 26 years because it works. And when I refer to energy efficiency, I'm talking about a number of different improvements that you can make to a building, including air sealing, to ensure that the building doesn't leak, insulation, uh, double or triple pane windows, LED lighting, and, um, and, and uh, energy efficient appliances, preferably electric appliances. Uh, the Northeast has led the nation for many years in demonstrating that energy efficiency is the lowest cost energy resource. And Rhode Island has participated in that leadership, uh, having been cited in the top 10 uh, within the ACEEE energy, uh, state energy um, scorecard for several years in a row, which measures a wide variety of energy efficiency interventions. Building on years of successful energy efficiency work, states have continued to drive investments in the building sector as an achievable and relatively low cost strategy to meet their climate goals. 
For years, energy efficiency has been New England's least cost source of energy. It has been providing real bill reductions for both program participants and even those who can't afford to participate in the program. Energy efficiency has held demand steady in the region for over a decade. Uh, that's part of what uh, Carrie referred to a little bit earlier tonight. And this reduces the need to build out additional grid capacity and infrastructure, which lowers all of our bills. Also, energy efficiency provides societal benefits, like providing good local jobs that don't necessarily require a college education, um, and uh, health outcomes, in some instances, life-saving benefits that come from weatherization. But as we all know, most people won't eat their broccoli just because it's good for them. Uh, so we need to continue to sell the other benefits of energy efficiency, like comfort, environmental um, attributes, asset value, cool new technologies, cost savings. And as it turns out, these are real benefits, uh, benefits that make our buildings much nicer places to live and work. As we look to this winter, energy efficiency can provide immediate and ongoing cost savings um, opportunities as electricity rates and gas, oil, and propane prices continue to increase. Participating in ratepayer programs to lower energy consumption will lead to real bill savings this winter. It's a relatively quick action that benefits individual ratepayers and helps us shed load from the grid at a critical time. <coughs> So why do we subsidize energy efficiency? Not only is it the least cost fuel, it is also the most equitable way to manage the strain on the grid. Every watt we save helps us avoid having to increase the capacity of the grid with costly infrastructure expansions. So a watt saved by you or me benefits those who can't afford to make energy efficiency improvements to their home. We need to work now to address the equity issues with respect to energy efficiency programs. All customers pay into the ratepayer programs, but not all households benefit equally. Low-income ratepayers, many of whom are BIPOC or otherwise marginalized, face significantly higher energy burden than the average ratepayer. In other words, a much higher percentage of their income goes to paying their energy bills uh, than for the average household. Um, and this is in part because they have less income to cover these costs and in part because often they live in buildings uh, that have not been retrofitted or well taken care of. So let's look at some of the barriers to energy efficiency. For individuals, often it comes down to a hassle factor. We must change program design and outreach quickly to ensure that rural households, immigrant households, seniors and low income households are not left behind. Um, for example, in Massachusetts, the utility administrators of the Mass Save program have proposed an expanded incentive program uh, that would use demographic markers um, at, at, at the census track level rather than household-based means testing to ensure that those with the highest energy burden are more likely to be able to participate in these programs and garner the benefits of energy efficiency. This is an innovative way to reach more underserved households quickly. Systematically, the barriers often stem from a lack of consistency and predictability in these programs. Collaboration in these efforts is key. For example, states can facilitate energy efficiency providers working together with LIHEAP programs uh, to find and serve households with energy efficiency as well as heating assistance and fuel subsidies. We can also introduce energy concierge services uh, that provide bilingual services and advise members of underrepresented communities on how they can bundle their energy efficiency work um, and braid together different sources of funding uh, so that they can have access to these programs. By thinking creatively, forging new partnerships, and moving fast, we can mobilize residential energy efficiency to help alleviate some of the short-term cost spikes ahead. And with the help that's coming from the Inflation Reduction Act, soon we'll have some more funding to do so. We need to do this because energy efficiency has been and continues to be our least cost energy resource. Energy efficiency provides real bill reduction for both participants and non-participants. 
This is abundantly clear when energy costs are as high as they are now. Energy efficiency provides societal benefits, both economically, um, economically quantifiable as a job creator, and other qualitative benefits, such as improved air quality and comfort and a lower risk of health and safety issues associated with homes that are extremely vulnerable to the cold or the heat. Energy efficiency's first cousin, <laughs> energy conservation, is also key. It increases the reliability of our grid. Um, California showed us this last month when cell phone alerts were sent out during uh, an, a time of extreme strain on the grid, and almost immediately there was an, uh, a drop in demand um, on the grid as a result. Looking ahead, energy efficiency will become more, not less, important as, uh, as our energy needs and um, to our energy needs as we start to electrify and transition to renewable energy sources and develop a multi-way grid. In order to meet the demand for energy efficiency, we need consistent, predictable, ongoing support for the framework and funding that drives the industry. This requires understanding and investing in this lowest cost resource now and going forward. This requires pushing for innovation in program design to improve the equity of program outcomes and capture the significant savings that are available from underserved households. Oh, <laughs> I think I have the wrong slide. The <laughs> you did skip one. I skipped one, yeah, you know what? Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, in any case, I am not a reassure. <laughs> I am Jennifer Marapisi. Um, I, I'm going to just close with a bit of a warning. Um, we need to ensure that policymakers, utilities, and funders don't get distracted by shiny objects. Whether they're excited about grid modernization or renewables or green hydrogen or storage, energy efficiency will be a critical first priority in being able to deploy clean energy in an affordable, equitable, and cost-efficient way. One of the biggest risks we face in transitioning to a clean grid is forgetting about the broccoli on our plate. So this slide was supposed to be a plate of broccoli. <laughs> um, that broccoli in the form of energy efficiency has been delivering the lowest cost energy, jobs, um, and uh, health and other, other benefits for a generation and will continue to do so uh, as our first fuel. And guess what? As it turns out, eating your broccoli is really um, not a painful process. Um, today's energy efficiency is actually about doing better while using less energy. Uh, for example, LED lights, much better than the incandescent lights. An air-sealed home is much more comfortable than one that's leaky. So maybe now's time to, op, uh, to update our broccoli metaphor and think instead of some sort of healthy comfort food like black bean chili or eating your chicken soup. Um, so let's all commit to eat our chicken soup or our black bean chili for the health and comfort and good of the grid. The winter's gonna be hard, particularly in the Northeast. This is the time to double down on all existing energy efficiency resources and innovate for the future. We need to be ready with program models, delivery models, and new sources of financing that can be supported with federal and other funding sources. Uh, thank you, and I'll look forward to the questions at the end. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting hungry, right? All that food talk. Uh, our, our next uh, speaker is uh, Eric Carlson. Uh, Eric Carlson is a, a doctoral student in uh, radio astrophysics at the University of Rhode Island and an adjunct professor of physics at Roger Williams University. Uh, Mr. Carlson has worked on a variety of projects which contribute to the sustainable approach to clean energy in the state of Rhode Island. Most recently, uh, Mr. Carlson has worked with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service on developing guidance for tracking of endangered birds and bats in and around the offshore wind lease areas. Uh, Mr. Carlson is current uh, 2022 Energy Fellow, uh, placed with the Cyber Physical Security Laboratory, uh, where he is developing models to identify cyber attacks against uh, residential power distribution grids. Here we go.
All right, thank you everyone. It's nice to see all my energy fellows here uh, to come and support. Um, so today we're gonna talk about smart grids and whether or not they're a source of reliability or a source of vulnerability. So we're gonna pivot a little bit from the energy demand and we're gonna talk about what is uh, coming down the road for our upcoming grid. So a quick overview of today's talk. We're going to talk about some terms and definitions to make sure everyone's on the same page. We'll then talk about the Stuxnet event, followed by uh, the 2016 Ukrainian power grid attacks, as well as the most recent attacks performed before the Russian incursion in Ukraine. Um, we're going to talk about the threat assessment in an average United States home and how you may or may not be uh, contributing to uh, insec uh, insecurities within our power grid. Um, we're also going to talk about some of the research and the prevention that goes on here at the university, and we'll conclude before uh, taking questions with the panel. So we're going to start off uh, with some terms and definitions to make sure everyone's on the same page. I think the first one is Internet of Things. Uh, we've all, you know, talked about our smart devices, our phones, our tablets, our laptops. We forget about the little things like uh, your washing machine or your, um, your oven, for example, which may have a connectivity feature to allow you to connect to your phone. Um, a common implementation of this that is currently happening in the state of Rhode Island is the deployment of smart thermostats through the RISE engineering program. These are all what we would consider part of the Internet of Things. To this end, a lot, of these, a lot of these devices are contributing to our smart grid. And so our smart grid uh, here is a electrical supply network that uses some of these digital technologies to detect and react to local changes. So we're going to talk about some motivation here. And so in 2009 and we're going to talk about the Stuxnet event. And so this started under the Bush administration and then rapidly pivoted to being under the Obama administration. We've all heard of the various policy attempts to address the Ukrainian uh, nuclear proliferation. However, one attempt was to disable Iranian centrifuges uh, via a method of injecting a worm. So the basic principle for uh, Ukrainian enrichment is the use of a centrifuge, and we've all probably heard this in the news. Um, and this simply works by taking our, uh, injecting some uranium fluoride gas into a canister and spinning that up. And what you're gonna happen is, uh, by the rotational energy of any particular particle, you're gonna get your heavier molecules on the bottom and your lighter molecules on the top. You can then pre-select for whatever uranium enrichment you might prefer, whether it's for weapons or uh, for energy development. So, the United States Cyber Command, NSA, CIA, um, collaborated with Mossad in terms of developing a uh, technique to um, physically manipulate the centrifuges to prevent the continuing enrichment of uranium in Iran. So the worm essentially worked like this. It utilized zero-day errors in the Windows operating system. We all know how popular Windows is as compared particularly for an industrial uh, application. A zero-day error in an operating system is something that the operating system ships with. So whether or not you've updated your computer, this error is going to be inherent in the operating system. It's something that's patchable, but very frequently when you have a government entity that is looking through an operating system looking for these events, Microsoft, in this case, has not had the opportunity to patch the event. This worm passed via USB drive. We all go around the office and we all share our USB sticks and we all transfer our files uh, with each other. This particular event, I might have a USB drive and I might give it to you and you'll download your files and you'll pass it on to the next person. And this particular uh, virus did not necessarily harm an individual's computer when it was initially given to them. It was looking for a marker, something that said, hey, I'm in a uranium centrifuge center and I am going to activate. So between the intelligence services, they identified the following steps. If you were on a Windows operating system and it was using the Siemens Step 7 software, then you would activate your code. 
And the code essentially performed a programmable logic controller attack. And this is something that is frequently used when disrupting uh, control assembly lines, industrial robotics, anything where you have a piece of software that's interfacing with a mechanical device which can be harmed. So for our centrifuge example, this would be overspinning the centrifuge, making it rotate at a rate that is so fast that you fatigue the metal and increase its ability to fail. So the outbreak of the virus kind of works like this. It was initially planted in June of 2009 and was distributed to various vendors that were assisting the Iranians with securing the parts that they needed for their centrifuge. This worked mostly to plan for the various intelligence agencies, but there's nothing stopping from this virus getting out into the world. And so that's what we saw here uh, in early 2010 um, in March, where the virus was first detected in the broader population. So you might think that having a virus with particular markers that are specifically targeted towards Ukrainian, excuse me, towards Iranian um, centrifuges, that we might not necessarily worry about uh, these viruses proliferating. That's where the 2016 uh, Ukrainian power grid attack comes into place. The Russians co-opted the work done by the United States and Israel and used a very similar uh, virus for the Ukrainian power grid attacks. This was based, as opposed to USB drives as they fall out of style, to more email-based phishing attacks to look for compromised passwords to be able to transfer these files from one device to another. It was a similar pro uh, programmable logical, excuse me, programmable logic controller attack where it took out uh, um, an uninterruptible power supplies, modems, RTUs, as well as switched off substations through the SCADA, a device used to monitoring grid uh, activity in a particular power grid. So I think a, a stopping point here as, as we transition towards where these events become relevant to us is to get a basic view of how our power grid is set up. So we have our generation and storage facilities. So this is gonna be our power grids, our wind turbines, um, our various substations, as well as our transmission lines. And all of these go down to a distribution network into one of our homes. So for many of these attacks, we're looking at attacks against the generation and storage uh, mechanisms. So we're looking for attacks against power uh, plants. We're looking for attacks against renewable energy resources. We're looking for attacks against the ISO. These are where traditional uh, energy attacks come to mind when we read a news uh, headline that says, such and such power grid was attacked by hackers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our homes are becoming ever more interconnected. And no longer are these attacks fully centralized on an ISO or on a power a distribution system, but they're now attacking our homes. The ability to connect to the power grid or um, the internet, for example, can make any household object a liability when it comes to uh, devices within the power grid which can damage the grid itself. So an example attack, for example, would be to access somebody's home uh, internet. You would be surprised how insecure somebody's home internet is. It does not take uh, an astrophysicist, for example, um, to guess at the password for your router's admin password. It's usually password, and most people don't change it. So the problem to this is once I have access to your rout router, I now have access to the various devices in your home which connect to it. That might be your heat pump, that might be your fridge, that might be your stove. As our representative from ISO talked about earlier, a lot of these devices turning on at the same time can have a huge impact on our power grid. If I, as a hacker, am either able to gain manual access to your uh, personal Wi-Fi or access via your filing, I, your files on your computer, for example, I now have the ability to simultaneously turn on all of these devices in everybody's homes. This very rapidly can damage the power grid. 
So transitioning from this, it's like everybody wants to move towards a smarter grid. Everybody wants to have more smart devices in their home. I'm not going out and saying, you know, send your cell phone through a paper shredder. Nobody wants to go back to that age. So here at the university, we have the Center of Cyberphysical Intelligence and Security. And so this is a uh, uh, United States Navy Office of um, uh, ONR, so it's Office of Naval Research, that funds our lab. And we specialize in the utilization of artificial intelligence and hardware in the loop simulations to test and train algorithms to identify and respond to power grid attacks. Now we have multiple members of our group. It's a fairly large group in electrical engineering. And some of us work on the actual uh, grid defense itself. Some of us work on developing new artificial intelligence algorithms. My project with the Rhode Island Energy Fellows for the last year has been looking at distribution networks. So these are what I was referencing earlier. These aren't the ISO transmission grids. These aren't the substations. These are the power lines that are going into your neighborhood. So to get uh, slightly more technical and away from motivation, um, I personally worked on a basic grid model um, that I developed. When you utilize artificial intelligence, you have to give it some training data. You have to, um, it's an advanced form of statistical regression. So you have to be able to say, these are items that I know are grid situations that aren't under attack, and this is a grid situation that is under attack. And so to that extent, I had to simulate a small distribution grid. And so to that extent, using some uh, previously uh, utilized software, I was able to develop a uh, 40 bus or so uh, distribution network with a variety of commercial, industrial, and residential uh, centers. I then developed a small sociological model, i.e. people go to sleep at night, people go to work during the day, you're going to see uh, increases in commercial when people are at work and perhaps decreases in residential. Extraordinarily basic. And I modeled that on an hour to hour. So as we can see, um, I have some of my, my blue is going to be my commercial loads. My green are residential over the uh, itemized over the course of an hour on a unitless y-axis. And this is referencing some, of, as you can see, you can see some of the trends over the course of a two days of people going to work, people coming home, and people going to sleep. So, as I mentioned earlier, the, the kind of step in this process that I'm working on right now is after generating several months of uh, unpolluted data, that's to say just general normal grid behavior, um, I've worked on developing a set of attacks against the simulated grid. These are um, mostly focused on what we would call false data injection attacks. That might be per uh, perhaps um, somebody is, uh, somebody's home is misreporting the amount of power that that home is drawing. And being able to identify those misreported variables to the SCADA by looking at other variables that are happening in the system. Once, we fin once I finish developing this model, applying the machine learning and the artificial intelligence is mostly just pushing, it, uh, pushing the model through and generating a model. The good part of this is once the model is produced, it can be deployed to help our ISO operators. It does, our artificial intelligence, it doesn't sleep. It doesn't go on vacation, and it's always learning based on the current situation in any particular power grid. So pending any questions, um, I think we'll p pass it back over to the moderator. That concludes my presentation. Hello? All right. So we're going to begin our Q&A portion. And um, if anybody has a question, if you could raise your hand, that'd be great. And we're going to try to do one person, or one question per person at the time, unless we don't have a, a lot of questions. So we've got one over there. Um, hi, thanks a lot. It was very interesting. Um, I heard a lot about <coughs> conservation and efficiency and, and everything. I, 
I didn't hear how we were going to address a 70% increase in need over the next 10 years for the electrification of vehicles. I, I think that's what I heard um, 10 years from now, our needs were going to be 70% greater. And I didn't, and I don't think conservation and efficiency is going to get us there. And I didn't really hear how we were going to get there. Hi, thanks for that question. So part of that is just re is doing the study to know, to say, this is what we need. So it gives us, as a region, a, a place to start to know where you're going. So when you have that baseline of what's happening, so now we know. That's like a really, that is one of the really big parts of why we do this sort of forward-looking research. And when we think about, there's two different ways that that energy, that new energy will come. One is from state goals. So Rhode Island has really ambitious clean energy goals to procure and build new um, resources. So there's just a brand new offshore wind solicitation that went out last week for 600 to 1,000 megawatts of offshore wind to come into Rhode Island. So if a pro within, oh my gosh, I don't remember the way you're supposed to be built by, but so within 10 years, so that's a new significant uh, amount of power that would come in. Um, also, you think about energy storage of being when it's really sunny during the day when there's a lot of power to store it now in battery technology and then release it when it's needed. I think the important thing to think about is a little bit about what Eric was saying about his AI was charting demand over the day. It's not a all day long will we need that much more power. It's at specific times of the day. So it's a little bit of where our new power resource is coming from, but also is how is how are we utilizing the power that we do have in a smart way to meet that time of demand. It's efficiency, it's battery technologies and storage technologies that are coming out. It's public policy that says, that gives a consumer like me um, a signal that, it, hey, we know the demand is coming from five to seven. Your electricity is gonna cost more to use more at that time. So maybe I wanna charge my one day electric vehicle overnight, not during that peak time where I won't run my dishwasher or my, my uh, laundry at that point of the time to bring down that demand so that we can meet the supply and demand better than just responding with more supply. So it's a, it's a give and take on the system. Um, but it is a change, and I think it is, it, when you look at that number, you're like, wow, that is a really big change. And it's a good question for the Rhode Island policymakers and everyone in the region who's part of this conversation to be part of. Does that help address that? Any other questions? This is more directed towards Eric. Uh, I guess uh, a lot of us in the recent news were obsessed with asteroids, but not realizing in 2012, two CMEs, coronal mass ejections, almost took out our grids if the Earth had been in a different, uh, had been in an earlier part of its orbit seven days earlier. How are we, in other words, uh, our transformers, we hardly had anything. They could have been totally fried, and at that time, the United States didn't make transformers. How are we, uh, in spite of any future su su stuck nets, say that three times fast, um, how are we hardened against Mother Nature attacks or hemp's in that sense for hardening in the civilian sector? That's a great question. So um, I always love to receive a uh, astrophysics question in a you know energy talk. Um, I think that's the first. Uh, granted, it's a relevant one, and I think we teach this in our intro astronomy class that people don't realize uh, that the sun is an extraordinarily dangerous thing that we have to live with. Um, back in the the late 1800s, uh, we had what was called the Carrington event. And the Carrington event was what we believed to be a solar uh, coronal mass ejection um, that uh, produced electric fields here on the planet so that we could see the northern lights throughout the United States. 
And what happened during this period of time, thankfully our power grid was not uh, appropriately developed. And we actually saw telegraph operators, uh, stations light on fire due to the overcurrent uh, in, uh, in their telegraph lines. Now, uh, a Carrington event style situation, as you, you know, uh, pointed out today, um, unfortunately, would kill millions, if not billions, of people. Many of us rely on the power grid uh, for our basic necessities. And um, many of our, uh, unfortunately, coronal mass ejections occur um, and can strike us uh, with little to no warning. Uh, solar monitoring and solar weather planning is an area that is of um, great importance to the Office of uh, Research at the Air Force, for example. Um, but in terms of hardening, um, unfortunately, it hasn't necessarily trickled into um, the commercial uh, and residential sectors yet. Uh, much of the hardening that we've done as a country uh, came about with the Cold War, with similar situations um, being resultant for EMP effects due to nuclear weapons. Um, so it is certainly something that as we become more and more techno technologically savvy, um, that we need to become aware that um, space wants to kill us. <laughs> So not an astrogeophysicist at all. But it, your question about reliability and thinking about it from a big grid perspective and something that Jennifer mentioned during her presentation was the Texas energy um, shortages that we saw this summer during two extreme heat waves. And you talk about the idea of potential rolling blackouts when there's not enough power, supply to meet demand, and what does that mean from a New England perspective? So part of my role at the ISO is I work on emergency operations and communications during an event, be it a natural event, be it a cyber crime, any type of event. It doesn't matter if it's impacting the grid system to what we're doing. And a lot of what we are thinking about in from a reliability standpoint is how do you manage that type of a problem? And it's something that we practice and that we train for. Uh, we do tabletop simulations, we do real life role playing every other year of a two day event with the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA and we practice what would we do if it was a physical attack on our building and how would we protect ourselves and we go through all the possible terrible worst case scenarios that you could imagine and think about where are the failures that we have now and how do we work to improve that. So I cannot talk about the Potential, there's no Faraday cage being built over the New England system here, but um, my little bit of physicist in me. Um, but we do practice this, and part of thinking about re reliability when we are electrifying more of our grid and more of our vehicles is, what does that mean for you? If my car is electric and there's a sustained power outage, how do I travel? Or if my heat and my air conditioning is electric now, how do I care for my loved ones and care for myself? So there's a lot more questions about what do those types of policies, which are, we're as a nation in a region, we're looking at to reduce our carbon impact, but there's lots of questions to answer on a day-to-day -day individual level that I can't speak to, but I can say that you know, from an ISO's perspective, reliability is our number one goal. In the end of the day, our goal is to keep the lights on. And when we talk about this winter and what does that mean about rolling blackout, I, it's not a good message to say that rolling blackouts are a tool, but they are. The worst case scenario is the grid being overloaded and shutting down. To start up a power system from zero is days, weeks, months of, of activity. To have a blackout for four hours and roll it through the system is a tool that the grid operators would use to make sure that the system as a whole retains its integrity. Great answers. Two more right here. <laughs> thanks. Well, thanks for a terrific presentation from the three of you. And I wanted to pursue the reliability question a little bit more. You know, here it is, uh, we're subject to extreme weather events. Uh, on one hand, we've got smart devices that help us operate those utilities within our households. And on the other hand, we've got electrical wires that are strung on dead trees. And so I'm wondering about 
about beginning to address those really root problems in an equitable way. How do we update the grid? We've got a 70-fold increase expected in electrical vehicles coming on board in the next 11 years, and we've got wires strung from dead trees. Hi. So, why are strung on dead trees? The amount of meetings that I have sat through talking about the impact of woodpecker holes on <laughs> transmission systems is really hours I will never get back. And, but it's a real factor, and there's costs associated to this. You know, in, if money were no option, we would underground our wires, and then they'd be protected from things like that. But that's not a... That's not an answer that's equitable or achievable from a public policy perspective. Even just um, that small bits of, you know, the work that we're doing to identify those that needs to be done is, is tough. So from an engineering perspective of how do we harden an actual tra like transmission line that runs down our street or a substation, those are questions I'm, I'm not an engineer and I, I can't help you answer, nor am I the best suited to. But I do know that at the state levels, the Rhode Island Public Utility Commission and different and NEMA, um, Rhode Island Energy Management Agency, there are collaborative programs between these different agencies, especially from an emergency standpoint, that says we see that there's a flooding risk here or heavy storm damage, and how do we manage our vegetation? How, where do we invest? What are the places that need the money the most right now in a way that can be uh, recouped from ratepayers that is conscious of the fact that we are in extraordinarily high inflation and fuel rates. So those are questions that are addressed at the state level. At the ISO level, the wholesale, the, the transmission lines that do power the whole, the region are those really big towers that you see that are steel and just huge, and they don't face the same types of um, wear and tear that your local lines do. But it's a question that, especially as we a lot of the infrastructure that we invested in in the 40s, 50s, 60s is coming to an age of needing to be replaced, and it's at significant cost. And what I see happening in the states is looking at the what we would call a non-wires alternative or a non-wires solution. So instead of building more or building again, can we install storage here? Or is there a place that you could put some other type of resource or a different type of policy that we don't have to keep rebuilding these transmission lines, but what are these technologies that, like Eric talks about, that our homes can use less, we can be more efficient, we can better insulate, so we all need less to re reduce the impact of those types of replacements. And let's see, John's question last. We, we've uh, been double booked in this room. <laughs> And there is a group of 80 people waiting right outside that door. They probably ate all our meat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, John, your question, I'll okay. some parting words, and then we can take this right out into the lobby, okay? Okay, Carrie, from an ISO perspective, <clears throat> one of the assumptions that has been made for a while is the Central Maine Power Hydro Project mm -hmm. coming on down for replacement of base load with renewable hydropower. So if that project does not happen and it's going through a lot of litigation, as you know. What is the ISO's thinking about what would be the replacement for that massive load within the time period? Sure. So the way that we look at that is from an ISO perspective that we are assuming that project is coming because it has signed contracts and this from the state. So this is just, you have to make a judgment call at one point of how do we model the next 10 years with this project that we think is coming, but is not. So it's currently inc included in a lot of our assumptions for ongoing studies, but the way that we think of it from an ISO's perspective is we're not selecting any specific project or resource. What would happen in that case, and this is a project that has a lot of litigation for environmental, economic, and social justice reasons, that is coming from Canada through Western Maine into Massachusetts. Um, that the, the market, if that left, there would be an opportunity and costs in the market would, it would be a market opportunity for a different project. So when you think about a, a, a technology neutral system that we currently have, which is what we've designed 
in the region that a different technology, would be, there'd be a market opportunity for a new technology to come in and replace that energy. What could that be? I don't know. Could it be other places have built transmission? New York is building transmission from Hydro-Quebec, from Quebec down to New York, but they have a different, they're a single state ISO. The states in New England do not agree. That's a really big challenge that can't be overlooked. And what will happen is a different projects, offshore wind, a solar, those are the types of projects that we're seeing that would come in, but perhaps it's not one big baseload project anymore. Perhaps we need to rethink about what is baseload. Are we, do we still have that in the future or do we have flexible resources with different types of ancillary services and characteristics that this is fast ramping, this is black start, that, are, that come together to kind of redefine what we think of as that generation mix. In other words, really simple questions with really simple answers. We have a number of URI Energy Fellows in the room. Can you raise your hands? The, the future, um, these students, among others, represent future solutions. Um, I want to say, besides the moral of this story being broccoli, how important broccoli is, woodpeckers and their role in uh, maintaining our energy system, and space, Eric. Um, thank, thank you, all three of you, for being here. Um, thank you to all of you. We're happy to continue the conversation out when we shift masses here from this room out into the library. There's a student group that's really looking to come in here. They've, they've got a, a lot of people. On behalf of um, Kaylin and I in Cooperative Extension and Kurta, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your support.